Welcome to this week's Midweek Meeting Gold and this is the Witness for Jesus channel and my name is Dawn. This week is full of really interesting points. Leviticus 16 and 17, Azazel, the good news and blood. I've had to make a decision this week on what to cover more thoroughly because I always want to keep the weekly summary to a reasonable length. So today you're going to hear some surprising and new information in regard to Leviticus and blood. Also a comparison of the Good News brochure with a passage of scripture. The meeting starts with the Day of Atonement. This is a wonderful topic to study because the Day of Atonement prefigures Jesus in so many ways. I'm going to let you go into that deeper study by yourself, but let's just point out something regarding the Azazel goat. What is interesting is that the Hebrew phrase La Azazel was translated in the King James Version as as a scapegoat and the Hebrew word Azazel was not entered into the text. In more modern versions, the word is entered as a sort of name of the goat. Personally, I think the King James Version is a good rendering because saying the goat is for Azazel seems to sound like the goat is for a person called Azazel. In fact, in the Book of Enoch, Azazel is said to be a demon, but the Book of Enoch is not part of the Bible, so we have to be very careful putting any credence to it. This goat had the sins symbolically put upon it and it was sent into the wilderness. Now we see that the old sacrificial system prefigures Jesus and the outline points out that this does relate to Jesus bearing our sins. The outline says, as the Apostle Paul explained, by Jesus offering his own perfect human life as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind, he accomplished far more than had been achieved by the blood of bulls and goats. Thus he served as the scapegoat, being the carrier of our sicknesses, the one pierced for our transgression. He carried away the sins of all those who exercised faith in the value of his sacrifice. He demonstrated the provision of God to take sinfulness into complete oblivion. In these ways, the goat, for Azazel, pictures the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, the teaching on JW.org is that Jesus' suffering, Jesus' suffering was purely to prove faithful. And here in this paragraph, the suggestion is that Jesus was only symbolically pierced for our transgression. The Bible says that Jesus did literally bear our sins in his own body on the tree in 1 Peter 2, 24. 1 Peter 2 is quoting Isaiah 53, which makes it very clear that God poured out punishment upon Jesus. Punishment. Since he was wounded for our transgressions and the text says that Jehovah laid upon him the iniquity or sins of us all. And it's very, very important to note that Jesus took the punishment for the sins of the world, not only symbolically, but actually in what he suffered, in what he suffered. Please look into that and read Isaiah chapter 53 very carefully, 1 Peter 2.24 and 2 Corinthians 5.21. Moving on, I'm going to quickly skip to the field service part before we cover the blood issue. The Good News from God brochure is discussed and under the title, What is the Good News? We have a subtitle, What is the News from God? It says God wants people to enjoy life on earth. He created the earth and everything on it because he loves mankind and soon he will act to provide a better future for people in every land. He will relieve mankind of the causes of suffering, Jeremiah 29 11. No government has ever succeeded in eliminating violence, disease or death, but there is good news. Shortly God will replace all human governments with his own government its subjects will enjoy peace and good health, Isaiah and Daniel. So what's the first thing you notice about these two paragraphs? All the scriptures quoted are from the Hebrew Bible. That is before Jesus came to earth. Secondly, the verses don't mention Jesus at all. They mention the new earth and that God will get rid of human governments to bring peace. Is this the good news message preached in the book of Acts. I'm sure you've read the book of Acts, haven't you? Can you recall the passage, any passage, where Peter, Paul or any of the early disciples preached that God was bringing a paradise earth? Now, I know what you're thinking. 
you're thinking this is the good news of the kingdom, God's kingdom government. Well, it is the good news of the kingdom, but there's an important point that's being missed here, an important person who is being missed here. The Apostle Paul outlined for us what the good news is at 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4 and said it is what we stand upon. If we don't have this good news, our faith is in vain. So what does he say at 1 Corinthians 15? He says that the good news is that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that he was raised on the third day and that he appeared to many. Please, I urge you then, read 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 to 4, then pick up the book of Acts. Read the book of Acts and find out, one, who were they witnesses of? And two, what exactly did they preach about? And that will be an eye-opener, I'm sure. Now then, blood. I've produced on this channel a series on blood, which you will find in the playlists. It's three parts. So while we're discussing Leviticus, I thought I'd play for you a clip of the first part of my blood series uh, on the Hebrew Bible. This takes a few minutes, but it'll be something that you've never heard before. Also, consider the enormous importance of the blood issue. You may die refusing blood, so you can spend a bit of time researching this matter, surely. This is all based on Leviticus, so here is a clip for you. Stay with it until it brings out something you may not have considered about Leviticus 17. Now we're at the point of the Levitical laws. In Leviticus, we now see clear instructions upon the actual eating of blood. In chapter 3, speaking of burnt offerings, verse 17 says that not only was the blood not to be eaten, but also the fat. This is considered by some scholars to mean parts of the animal, such as certain inner organs. This inclusion of the fat being forbidden continues in chapter 7 where God says in verse 25 that if a person eats the fat of the offering, he should be cut off from his people. This is the exact same restriction as the eating of the blood, as confirmed just two verses later in verse 27. So I don't recall ever thinking about this in my previous studies on blood, that in this passage, the type of offering required is that the fat is also forbidden and it carries the same heavy penalty as the restriction upon not eating blood. This is because the particular offering, a burnt offering, was to be set aside as something given to God. This is relevant because it was not only blood which was therefore set aside. Being set aside is actually the root of the word in Hebrew, kodosh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, and it denotes something which is holy. Holiness is something set apart for God. In this case, not only the blood of the animal was kadosh, but also the fat. Now we come to Leviticus chapter 16. In this chapter, we see details in regard to sacrifices to atone for sin. Sin is anything which goes against God's holy standards, and Paul would write much later that anything which is not of faith is sin. The word atone is kippur, which means to cover over the sin. Think for a moment then about the background to this. Before these laws were put in place, humans, such as Abraham, performed animal sacrifices for themselves and their families, making an altar wherever they wished. This had led to people committing idolatry. If you recall, the Israelites had learned idolatry in Egypt and had made a golden idol of a calf which is considered by some to be the Egyptian goddess Hathor. Leviticus 17.7 therefore confirms that they shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons after whom they have played the harlot. Now God had established a place which would be specific for a sacrifice, a place made holy or set apart for that purpose. Everything that God put in place in the tabernacle later to be the stone temple that was built in Jerusalem, was a shadow of the reality in heaven and prefigured Jesus Christ in detailed ways. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 says, They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. 
For this discussion, we simply need to know that a sacrifice must be brought to the tabernacle and the priest must be part of this. In Leviticus 16, Aaron the high priest was told to atone for himself and his family, the temple itself and the people. And this was done by the killing of animals and the sprinkling of blood inside the temple, specifically the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest may enter. Therefore, God established an important precedent. The blood of the killed animal was appointed to make atonement. It's extremely important to consider the whole chapter of Leviticus 17 because it's easy to make an error. Verses 10 to 12 taken entirely alone say this. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood. I will cut him off from among his people for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. These verses could be interpreted to say that the blood itself, the actual substance of blood, the fluid which goes around an animal's veins, is the thing which atones. However, the rest of the chapter makes it clear that the blood is representative of life. The chapter begins telling us that if a person sacrifices an animal outside of the camp and doesn't bring it to the tabernacle as an offering, he is disobeying the command to only perform sacrifices in the tabernacle. God therefore sees that sacrifice as a needless death and as such God says that the person becomes blood guilty. It's clear that this relates to the fact that the blood has been shed wrongfully. In other words, the life of the animal has been taken wrongfully. Moreover, in the same chapter, verse 13 says that if an animal is killed for food only, the blood is poured out onto the ground and covered with dust. Now this indicates that whilst blood is treated as special, the actual fluid itself is not what atones as of course a lot of blood will never be used in sacrifice and is simply poured out onto the ground. Allow me to explain this a little by talking about what God demands from a sinner. Put simply, the Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death. This means that the sinner himself should die. In this Levitical arrangement, God allows the animal to die in the person's place. The people should die for their sins, but instead animals die. What is given to God is the life of the animal and that life is symbolised by the blood of the animal. What does God demand of sinners? Not their physical blood, the fluid in our veins, but he demands their life. Blood is the symbol of that life which is given because the blood is poured out and the creature expires. Leviticus 17 verse 14 says that it is the life of the flesh, its blood sustains its life. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. Clearly the blood, the substance of blood, by going around the veins, sustains the life of the animal. When its life is given in sacrifice, the blood therefore symbolically represents the life given and the blood then symbolically cleanses the people of their sin. The reason to abstain from eating blood is because God had chosen blood as the symbolic substance to be used in the atonement ceremonies, and as such, they were to show reverence to blood. When pouring out blood onto the ground, when they killed an animal also, they showed respect for God's sovereignty as life giver. You might be thinking, all of this is obvious, but... The understanding of this is really important when we come to the Greek scriptures, our New Testament, and how this affects the way Christians view the blood of animals and humans. Before we conclude on Leviticus 17, we should not omit the concluding verses of the chapter, wherein we learn something extremely important in regard to this discussion. From verse 15, And every soul that eateth that which died of itself, or that which was torn with beasts, 
whether it be one of your own country or a stranger, he shall wash both his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even, then shall he be clean. But if he wash them not, nor bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. This passage is speaking of eating an animal, not properly bled, an animal which died of natural causes. God is here acknowledging that a circumstance could arise wherein the person is hungry and eats an unbled animal. This would, of course, be considered to happen where there is no other meat available. Don't forget, they experienced scarcity of food on many occasions and were expected to hunt their food. What's notable is that if a person ate an unbled animal in this situation, then the punishment was simply that he was unclean until evening. But earlier in the chapter... We read that eating blood meant a person is cut off from his people. Clearly, then, eating blood deliberately, pouring it out and drinking it, maybe, is seen differently than eating an unbled animal when you are hungry and desperate for food. God is here respecting that a human being can sustain his life by eating an unbled animal. There is a principle which I'll mention here which comes into play. Pikuash nefesh. This literally means saving a life. It is something still observed by the Jews today, and the principle is that you may break a law in order to save a life. Certain verses are cited by the Jews about this, such as Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 11, which says, And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. The implication here is that Jews should live by Torah law rather than die because of it. The Jews will not break laws on idolatry or murder, but otherwise will break a law if it's to save a life in a life or death situation. When we get to the New Testament in the next video in part two, I'll provide evidence that Jesus himself taught this principle, that a law could be broken to save a life. Basically, life is more important than law. Just as a side note before we leave Leviticus, the eating of blood is mentioned in Leviticus 19 verse 26 and is listed alongside not practising divination, not shaving the sides of your head and not trimming your beard. Some people who use the Old Testament to judge others in respect of certain behaviours should remember that we are not under the law anymore. But in regard to Pikuash Nefesh, there's another passage where Israelites eat animals that have not been properly bled. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, we read about a situation of war under King Saul, and the people were forbidden to eat all day by Saul. And in verse 32 of 1 Samuel 14, we read that they ate meat with its blood. Now they were rebuked by Saul in verse 33, but they simply made an altar and then sacrificed in the proper manner by properly outpouring the blood to correct this. They were not killed for this behaviour, and in the next chapter Samuel simply rebukes Saul, saying that obeying in the first place is better than not obeying and then performing a sacrifice. This passage doesn't seem to be considered in the Jehovah's Witnesses literature about blood. If it is, I haven't found a reference. Surely this is an important passage, because again it ties with Leviticus 17, wherein if you are extremely hungry, you can eat an unbled animal. This suggests that your life is more important at that point than the law respecting blood. There we go. I really hope that this week's review has been interesting to you. And next week we'll discuss the very important topic of protecting children from abuse hugely important so please join me next week and here's a challenge for you read some of the book of acts this week if not all of it remember i asked you to see who they are witnesses of and in whose name did they do everything and what did they preach exactly why not comment in the video comments have a great week